Good evening and welcome to the 12th annual Mental Health Services Awareness Night. I'm James Palmer and I'm a general and child and adolescent psychiatrist at the Utah Valley Psychiatry and Counseling Clinic. Thank you for joining us tonight. I congratulate you on your desire to help those in our community with mental health challenges. For many years, we've known that at least 20% of the national population is diagnosable with a mental health condition, but our world has changed significantly in the past eight months with the COVID-19 pandemic, and people are dealing with unforeseen levels of stress and anxiety. While the physical impacts of the pandemic are in front of us on a daily basis, the mental impacts are a growing concern that also deserve our attention. This event has grown into an annual tradition. Uh, this is its 12th year. It came out of discussions at a community advisory group at Intermountain Utah Valley Hospital. Several organizations came together to organize and host an evening workshop that focused mainly on Utah County. This year, we have moved to a virtual format to help protect the health and safety of participants. This format also allows us to expand our reach to the entire state, so welcome to the entire state. Our focus is to build awareness. Many of you are in a community leadership role of some sort, be it church, school, city government, justice system, physicians. Other people look to you for help and advice. We understand that's a heavy burden that comes with tremendous responsibilities, and we thank you for that. Other people in our audience are experiencing their own mental health challenges or helping a loved one who is struggling. We also sincerely appreciate those efforts. We want to support all of you. So our goal tonight is to arm you with as much knowledge as possible about the resources available across our state. Our goal is for everyone to understand where they can start looking for resources and answers to their questions. Tonight, we have two incredible presenters and we want to thank each of them for their generous support of our event. Each speaker will have approximately 30 minutes for the presentation. Each speaker, has agreed to accept questions through email. Their email addresses can be found on our website, www.utahvalleyhospital.org backslash mental health night. Again, that's www.utahvalleyhospital.org backslash mental health night. Our website also includes links to various resources across the state of Utah. These links can be found at the bottom of the website and they're organized into different geographic areas. After the speakers conclude, I will explain more about these resources. It is now my pleasure to, intru to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Astrid S. Tuminez was appointed the seventh president of Utah Valley University in 2018. Born in a farming village in the Philippine province of Ilioli, I'm sorry, I mispronounced that, Iloilo, President Tuminez moved with her parents and six siblings to uh, the slums of Iloilo City when she was two years old, her parents seeking better educational opportunities for their children. Her pursuit of education eventually brought her to the United States, where she graduated summa cum laude with a bachelor's degree in international relations and Russian literature from Brigham, from Brigham Young University in 1986. She went on to earn a master's degree from Harvard University in Soviet studies in 1988 and a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in political science in 1996. Before assuming her current position, President Tuminez was a world leader in the fields of technology and political science, most recently serving as an executive at Microsoft, where she led corporate, external, and legal affairs in Southeast Asia. She also served as the former Vice Dean of Research and Assistant Dean of Executive Education at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, the premier school of public policy in Asia. She and her husband, Jeffrey S. Tolk, have three children. In her spare time, she enjoys running, dancing, and martial arts. Dr. Tuminez, thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, thank you, Dr. Palmer, and thank you to all of the organizers of this Mental Health Awareness 
night and thank you for the valiant attempt to say Ilo Ilo. You did very <laughs> well. <laughs> you did very well. I'm very proud of you. So um, I am not sure how many people we have in, in this conference tonight. And I apologize that we are meeting um, virtually, but in a way, the way that we're getting together these days is a sign of our resilience, which is the topic that I want to discuss this evening. So I want to thank you for this effort to improve awareness of mental health and also spread information about the resources that are available in our neighborhoods and in the state of Utah. You are doing amazing work and today in fact is thank you Thursday for UVU and every Thursday we select people to thank and today we thank our student health services because they've been delivering uh, teletherapy over the last half year with, with the pandemic and we have found a 300% increase in the um, request by students to get mental health uh, assistance. So thank you for everything that you're doing. When we think about mental health, I think the problem is very real. And uh, we've alluded to the number earlier that there are literally millions of adults in America that suffer from mental illness. And if you think about it, uh, half of these cases begin by the age of 14. And on the other side of this slide, you could see some of the numbers for the state of Utah. I think the one that made me saddest looking at this was that Utah is one of 11 states where children with mental health disorders exceed 20%. These numbers are important because uh, they remind us that behind every statistic and every number are real individuals, real parents, real children, real families who suffer and who have a very tough time with mental illness. And um, I found this picture of, of some of the fires that we've had, one recently in Provo Canyon. So when we think about 2020 with a pandemic, uh, with the polarized politics in an election year, uh, fires that have destroyed in California and elsewhere millions of acres, and then economic difficulties at the moment, I think it's very normal for uh, many of us to feel uh, that, that these are difficult times. So I pose this question, do you sometimes feel overwhelmed? And as president of Utah Valley University, I do realize that how I show up myself with positivity and confidence is quite important. But I also look at this question, do you sometimes feel overwhelmed? And my answer to that is I do, and others do too. And for all of us who are on this call, the feelings of being overwhelmed or overstressed or depressed can be very real. And if we are at the front lines, uh, including I know ecclesiastical leaders who are on this call, we need to be very aware of not letting these feelings of being overwhelmed overtake us because we have work to do. And this leads me to this question of resilience, whether we are working in hospitals or clinics or we are guidance counselors in a middle school or high school, or we are running a university, or we are running a church congregation, I think it's important that we take care of our own selves and um, think about how we could be more resilient. What is resilience and why does it matter? Uh, the most um, common uh, maybe image of resilience is a rubber band that you know you can stretch it and then when you let go, it simply goes back to its original shape. So resilience is the ability to recover. It's the ability as leaders or caregivers for, it's the ability to stay uh, focused, positive, and moving forward. And this is important because whether we are talking about families or church or organizations, the way we all show up every single day is quite important. And I have noticed that with the pandemic over many months, uh, you know, uh, people's resilience may be fraying and people are getting tired, uh, they have fatigue, but we need to remember that this is really important. So what I'd like to do is share a little bit about my own personal experience with resilience and then later talk about how we can grow resilience. There are certainly people gifted with more resilience than others, but I believe that it is an ability that we can grow and there's enough literature 
in positive psychology, for example, that points out that growing resilience is doable. So the first way that I learned resilience is because I grew up in this neighborhood that you see in the scripture. My hut is somewhere in the middle behind uh, the hut right there in the center of the picture. And there would be low tide and high tide. The hut was on stilts in the water. And on the lower right, here's a picture of uh, me and my siblings and an aunt and an LDS missionary behind my sister in the red dress. So um, it's very common in the part of the Philippines where I grew up for typhoons to strike every year, sometimes a couple of times a year. And these typhoons, particularly when the tide was high, were extremely frightening. And um, as a little child, I would usually try to find a place to hide and the hut, because the roof was made of grass, it would get wet inside. So if the typhoon was raging at one or two in the morning, you know, you tried to find a table or a chair under which you could crawl and kind of last the night. And it, it's frightening, the hut would shake, and then there would be stray posts or logs that would pummel the stilts in which my house stood. And this was a very real lesson in resilience because even though I was afraid all night long, and, and I would think that this was it, this was the end, we'd all just fall and drown. Um, to wake up the next day was a very important lesson for me to know that the storm had passed and that the storms would keep coming. And, and perhaps this is also just a, um, a stroke of luck that, that you know, our, our heart never fell. But nonetheless, it was a real thing that this physical situation taught me that I couldn't control storms, but that in some ways, you know, they were survivable and life would continue the next day. The other thing that was really relevant to my early resilience was uh, the experience of poverty. I was once asked to ask to give a talk to seventh graders at Singapore American School, where my uh, children also attended. Now, this is a school that's one of the best international schools in the world, very exclusive. You know, for students to attend middle school, they have to pay tuition and fees of $31,000 a year. So these children had no idea about poverty and they were doing a social studies module on poverty and invited me in. So I described to them what my life was like when I was their age. And you can see this on the slide, what the conditions were of childhood. And, you know, at the time, I didn't think that this was a blessing. But to be really honest today, I think this was this was sort of the best thing that happened to me. Um, just not having any luxuries not having any money to throw out my problems. And every day kind of getting up and saying, you know, I'm going to make it through the day. I'm going to do good things. I'm going to learn. Um, so, so this was a blessing as I look back on it because early in life, I learned to ask the questions that you see here. What can I learn from my situation? And I, again, this is part of resilience because if we can learn from the situation, we can be resilient. So when I cooked rice, the first time I cooked rice, I was six years old and it, was, it looked just like this in a pot and I had to learn to make a fire without burning the hot down. So I had to say, what can I learn? And then how can I solve my problem? Since we had no water, we, get, we had to get a bucket, you know, go to the well, bring some water back and how do I use as little water as possible? and still be able to wash my clothes. So now these are problems that billions of people today face. I was not unique. But I look back on this as a very formative time where hardship and difficulties actually helped me to be resilient and to know my own abilities and to use my mind to solve problems and also work with my family and my neighbors to improve the situation that we found ourselves in. Another thing that was really critical for my early childhood resilience was education. The nun that you see in the middle of this picture was a nun who found my family when I was five years old and invited me and my sisters to attend uh, the college, the school that they run for free. This is a very expensive, very exclusive school. And I was illiterate on the first day, I couldn't spell my name, but they gave me a chance to learn letters and numbers. And education completely exploded my mind. It, it exploded my mind in the sense of telling me there was a bigger world out there. There was such a thing as science. Uh, the, the frog, when you open a frog, it had different organs. So it just made my mind kind of expand 
unimaginably in terms of what I could understand and what was out in the world and also what I could imagine. So uh, in this school at the age of 10, you know, I picked up Time magazine and read about New York City. And I said to myself, I'm going to live in New York City someday and also work for the United Nations. And that's a crazy thing for a 10 year old to think about. But if we educate children, if we educate people who are having a hard time, I think the chances of uh, being able to help themselves uh, and imagine what else they could be is, is going to be enhanced. So education made a difference. And in addition to that education, I had the opportunity to observe leaders. You see on this picture, my sixth grade teacher, the nun who found my family, and this was when she was in her early 20s, and then my first uh, grade teacher on, on, the, on the right hand. As I observed these women, I observed that they were smart, they were intelligent, they were managerial, they were able to manage tasks, they were able to lead people, they were able to communicate, and they had a strong spiritual foundation. And as I observe these behaviors, and I think for all of us, when we look around at the people we admire or the people who we think are making a difference, we should observe what qualities they have that make them show up day after day in good spirits, wanting to help others and feeling strong, regardless of what the circumstances may be that they are facing. Um, so these adults made, made a big difference in addition to my education. And then I would also single out faith as another really critical part of the foundation of my personal resilience. And my faith foundations included the Catholic Church because the nuns educated me and I never missed a Sunday of confession or going to church. You could go on Saturday or Sunday. And then when I was uh, 10, I converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, what I got from faith is sort of a superpower of sorts in that all I had really was my mind and my brain. But I began to believe that there was more to life than the day-to-day -day challenges. And I began to also think that... Um, I could count on divine help, and I also believe that I had divine potential. And so when you take a kid from the slums who didn't have any privileges, and that kid begins to think that she has divine worth, it is extremely empowering and is able to, at least for me, gave me the foundation where, uh, yes, I would still have challenges, and uh, yes, my faith was imperfect, but I, I had very real experiences that helped me to um, kind of find core strength, a strength that I believe is actually uh, serving me to this day as I have gotten older. And then the final thing that I would talk about in terms of my personal resilience is, you know, just life itself. If we are lucky to live a long enough life, and I have lived for decades now, um, there are things that will be uh, surprising, unpredictable, horrific, terrible. And this is what happened to me on 9-11, uh, 2001. I was five months pregnant, and I was on my way to work, and I got out of the subway and saw the World Trade Center above me was burning. And I thought, you know, what should I do? I know my husband told me that morning that he had a meeting at the World Trade Center, and his office was just across from the World Trade Center. Because I was pregnant, I, I ran to my office, and um, in, any, in any case, the end result of that day was that it was pretty um, horrific what happened. As New Yorkers, you know, the days and weeks of seeing posters of missing people and knowing that they wouldn't be found. And my office was actually only six blocks from the World Trade Center. And it was amazing that two weeks after this incident, we all returned to work. The subway started working, the smoke was there, the smell was there, but it was amazing to see the city and my own neighbors step up and say, we can overcome this and we will rebuild and we will help one another. And um, so this, this is one of those things that I think, you know, life itself deals us things that we don't expect. And then we are tested and, and, and if we do well and are able to uh, work with what is in front of us to, to accept that, that things are what they are, but then what can we do? I think this also really um, can help us build resilience, our very own life experiences. 
So moving from the personal to, to, to general principles, and I am watching the time just to make sure that I don't uh, go past my 30 minutes. Um, resilience, as I said earlier, could be a gift. It could be like this green plant and fertile ground that's just really easy for you to grow and be resilient. Other times, there are those of us who are more like this yellow flower. It's really resilience. It's really tough for us. And we have to struggle more in order to become resilient. But I will emphasize again that it is a quality and a skill that we can nurture and grow. So I will throw some questions here which have to do with resilience and the foundations of resilience. And I'll talk about those foundations in a second. When you look at these questions, you could, you could ask if you are you know, on the right side of the equation or, or the left side of the equation. If you are on the right side, very true, you're more resilient. If you're on the left side, you're less resilient. And it's important that we become aware of how resilient we are today. So when I catch myself responding negatively to any situation, do I ask, what is the positive in this? So the second question is, I respond to failures and mistakes as a chance to learn and grow. Three, I find meaning in my work by aligning it to what I care about. And for, for those of you who are caregivers in the mental health space, you are truly doing something so meaningful. And so I hope that number three is very true for you. I constantly focus on how changes will help me serve others better. I have a strong and diverse support system at work and at home. I spend enough time with the friends and family I trust, getting the support I need, because we don't have to be on this journey alone. And I focus my attention on what is within my control rather than feeling a victim. And finally, I take control of my well-being. I exercise, I eat well, and I sleep enough. And most of us probably are guilty of not doing very well. Oh, number eight, because I never sleep. And I try to go do my exercise having not slept, which is not very good. Um, and it is only later in life that I actually learned to eat better. As a student at BYU, I used to subsist on one Snickers bar, you know, in the late afternoon. And I realized later in life how just how horrible that was. So those eight questions have to do with four pillars of resilience. So the first one, those first two questions have to do with optimism. Do we see the glass full or do we see the glass half empty? You can see on this slide the two basketball coaches for men's basketball and women's basketball at UVU. And I don't think you can be a good coach unless you're optimistic because at any point in the game, you can't give up. So how do we react? Um, do we ask in any situation, especially the difficult situation, do we ask what's possible? What good can come out of this? What's the learning that I can learn? And it may not happen immediately, but I think it's, it's important to be aware that we can exercise choice, however difficult that might be. Um, optimism is really about choosing the narrative. And there is a, a wonderful book called The Growth Mindset by Carol Dweck that's very, very popular. And she juxtaposes the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. So with the growth mindset, you can see here what the person tells herself, I can learn anything. When I'm frustrated, I persevere. When I fail, I learn. I try hard. Uh, I'm not innately bad or good, you know. Things are fluid. Whereas for the fixed mindset, I'm either good at it or I'm not. When I fail, I'm essentialist. I'm, I say I'm essentially terrible. And I want perfect results all the time so people can tell me I'm smart. And if, I, if others succeed, I feel threatened. My abilities determine everything. So if we pause here for a second, I want to highlight um, another book called Authentic Happiness by Martin Seligman, who's a pioneer in positive psychology. And in that book, he also highlights um, you know, this type of thinking, how helpful it can be for people to be able to think positively. And recently, I learned about an alumnus of UVU, Porter Hancock, who's from Kamas, Utah. And Porter, when he was uh, 16 years old, um, this is a story about optimism. When he was 16, he, he was a football player in Kamas. In the middle of that game, he dislocates his neck and damages two discs and wakes up the next day paralyzed, age 16. He went through an entire year of very, very difficult physical therapy. And at the end of that year, the doctors say to him, you will never walk. 
So you can well imagine that why should this person have any optimism? He's 16, he just lost the ability to walk and to play football. And after a year of effort, he was told, you will never walk. Instead, he focused on a different story so that he could strengthen his arms and he would do you know, different types of therapy. And the end of it is that uh, Porter uh, actually began to play uh, quad rugby, and I actually had to look that up. It's rugby on wheelchairs. And this is not for the faint. This is not for the weak. This is for extremely strong people. And he tells, uh, uh, he had an interview with UVU magazine in which he said, you know, his motto is smashing stereotypes one wheelchair at a time. And he adds, my physical strength has been taken and my mental strength tested, but it hasn't been broken. I've learned that mental strength far outweighs any physical strength you think you have. Mental fortitude propels you and picks you up when you are in a bad circumstance. So I think this is a very important lesson from Porter. Mental fortitude is about optimism and selecting how we're going to react. The second foundation of, of resilience is grit, and it's somewhat related to optimism, although it's, it's, it's different. It's about persevering. And I want to begin with the story of Yursa Mardini. I first heard this story when I was working for Microsoft prior to coming to UVU. Uh, Yursa is from Syria, a country that has completely failed. It is a failed state with a massive civil war. More than half of their population is either displaced within the country or have fled as refugees. So Yursa is, was strong to begin with because she's an Olympian swimmer. But because of this war, she and her family had to flee. And there were 20, her family and a few other people, 20 of them who worked with smugglers to put them on a little boat that was good for six people, but 20 of them were put on this boat and they made it to Turkey and now they have to make it to Greece. And they got on the boat and halfway into this journey, the motor failed. And so Yursa and three other passengers, including her sister, jumped off and tried to push this boat towards Greece, but the three other people eventually gave up, their strength failed, and Yursa continued alone. Uh, according to the story, she pu pushed, she tugged, she pulled all the way to Greece. And in the process of doing this, she saved not only her life, but the lives of 19 other people. So, so this story really, truly exemplifies grit. And there is a book called Grit by Angela Duckworth that argues that grit is more powerful than IQ, uh, is more powerful than many other things in in helping people succeed or be resilient in life. I've learned from many athletes here uh, at UVU how to be gritty and persevering. And um, I've learned from running. I started running at the ripe old age of 45. And at 45 here, this picture of me on the right is running my first marathon in St. George. And my knee, uh, something happened at around mile nine. And I, I had to run all the way. I, had, I still had so many miles to go. It took me just under five hours. And I actually had to really learn grit. And I dedicated every mile to one of my children. I had a friend who was in the hospital dying of cancer. And one of my lessons is that grit and perseverance, it often depends on our ability to think of other people and their needs and our, and our good wishes for them. And when they're cheering us on, that's also helpful. As a university president, I'm a fan of wrestling. I'm kind of weird. People think that that's a little bizarre, but I knew nothing about wrestling. And when I came to UVU, um, I started to uh, you know, appreciate the sport. And sometimes when I look at those of you who are in mental health, you are in the world's broad field of battle. And to be resilient is something that, that is truly important for you, but we can learn from athletes, how they get up every time they fall and how they recover. And the pandemic has also taught many of us to be gritty. Um, at UVU, we've had to recognize many heroes who in the past seven months have really stepped up above and beyond what uh, they normally would be doing. So we've got optimism, we've got grit, and the third element of resilience is a support system. Do we have friends that we trust? Do we have family members who care about us? Um, in this picture, I have my family and some members of my cabinet here at UVU. We can't do this journey alone. And I sometimes talk about having a personal board of directors. These are people who love us, but will also tell us the truth and will be there for us. And we can expand this network of support to our fellow professionals, 
to people in our faith or people outside of our faith who are our friends and our allies. And when I was living in Asia um, and was an advocate for women in leadership, I found so many men and women to work with, and they were so important for my own ability to continue with, with uh, a work that was difficult, but I believed in doing. Well, the support system may sometimes require professional help. And this is a picture of a sculpture. My husband and my son are in this photo. This is a sculpture that I saw in Singapore uh, during what was a very, very difficult time in my life. And I think I'm a very resilient person, but I faced something in my life that was so difficult that the only way that I could possibly express it was this sculpture. So when I saw this sculpture, sculpture it just spoke so strongly to me. It is called grief. And, and the lesson that I learned here is sometimes friends are not going to be enough, family are not going to be enough, we're going to need professional help. And so I actually sought a therapist whom I saw four times, and this therapist helped me talk through some of the things that were going on in my head. And so there is no shame to this. I think this is part of the support system that we must build. And then fourth, the, the uh, final element of, of resilience is control. We need to be able to see ourselves not as victims, but people with some control, not all control. We can't control everything, but let's ask ourselves, what can we control? So I talked earlier about sleeping and eating or getting pe toxic people out of our lives. What is it that we can control? And when I think about control, um, the opposite of what psychologists call learned helplessness, I think about this prayer, the serenity prayer, uh, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. I think this is a very profound prayer. And even if we can only do something so little, but when we experience a feeling of control again, it builds our confidence and it helps us to become more resilient people. And finally, what's also under our control are the questions that we ask. I really love the way Martin Luther King Jr reinterpreted the story of the Good Samaritan when he talked about the priest and Levite who ignored this man who had been beaten to a pulp on the road to Jericho. These two men failed to help others because the question they asked was the wrong one. If I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Good Samaritan asked the right question. If I don't stop to help this man, what will happen to him? And so the questions that we ask are also under our control. What is important? What is meaningful? Where should our time go? Uh, what are our values? I will end with just a couple of points about Utah Valley University, where I've been president now, and we are probably, most of us on this call, our neighbors. Our first core value at this university is exceptional care. And it was so important for me to articulate this as a new president, because I believe very strongly that the more we care for people, the more we see them as they are, the more we can create a sense of belonging, the more we can overcome our challenges, have fewer mental health um, issues and succeed together as a community and as a team. The pictures that you see on this slide are in a booklet called With the Wind Stories, and they're also uh, on the website of UVU if you are interested, but every person here has a story to tell. We are collecting a hundred of these stories ranging from recovering from cancer or addiction or being abused for six years by a husband or being blinded at birth or having such a severe stutter or being left by your mother in the middle of Belgium at the age of 11 and you become a street kid. All of these stories are so powerful and so real. And I found these stories when I first came to UVU that I would hear these stories and I would think, my gosh, these people are so resilient. They're so amazing. And it's important that we share these stories because um, they empower all of us as we work in the space of mental health. And I will just end with this picture, which I hope uh, you all love. These pictures, the two pictures here were taken when my son, who was 16 at the time, uh, a couple of years ago, when he and I went to Finland to see the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights. And at the time, my son knew that I'd applied for the job at UVU, and he was angry at me, very, very upset because I was destroying his life, and I was going to bring him to this place called Utah, and he knew nothing about it and had never lived here, and I was ruining his beautiful life in Singapore. But we went there, 
And actually this experience uh, not only helped us reconcile a, a little bit, and I have to say he's, he's forgiven me now, but also we learned all the elements of resilience here. So when you go to see the Northern Lights in Canada or Norway or Finland, you have to be optimistic. People spend money and they never see the Northern Lights. You have to be really optimistic. You have to believe that this is possible, that you'll see this magic. Number two, you have to be really gritty. I hate cold weather. I hate winter. And this is many, many, many degrees below zero. And every day they'd make us wear, you know, snowshoes or, or take us to an awful place where it's so cold through the forest. And, and if you can't see it there, you have to move to another place. So you have to be really gritty. And we did this five nights and then three of those nights we saw the Northern Lights. So you have to be gritty. Number three, we had to have a support system. My son and I couldn't do this on our own. We had people who helped us when, you know, driving a snowmobile, uh, who gave us in that TP that you see, we were in that TP freezing to death. And somebody had a box of cheap cookies and the sugar was so amazing because it helped us recover. So the support system is important. And, and then finally, you know, what's under our control? I think during this whole trip, uh, meeting people that we didn't really know, and asking together, what can we do, agreeing on, you know, we could get on, uh, in a van to go to another place to see if the Northern Lights might be there. And we were rewarded with this amazing dance of lights in the sky and this magic. So I'd like to end with this and just uh, thank you all again for being here tonight. Thank you for everything that you do to keep our communities as, as healthy as possible, to feel supported and to help people have hope to believe in themselves and to never give up. I believe that when we act as a community to uh, help one another and to improve mental health, the metaphorical, metaphorical equivalent of magic and this Northern, Northern Lights can happen. So again, thank you all very much. Thank you so much, President Tuminas, for sharing that tremendously valuable information with us tonight. I love the idea of resilience you presented, how, how we all can develop that and possibly be more like rubber bands I appreciate you Andrew, <laughs> sharing your growing up and developmental experiences throughout childhood. Even as an adult, uh, as someone who has had a rough time with running myself, I can appreciate the grit that it takes in, in running through a marathon after, after an injury at mile nine, like you said. And, and as you said, we, we might not be able to control the storms, but we can develop the resilience to respond to them. And I, I so appreciate your, your thoughts and putting that together in time and sharing uh, that all with us. So thank you again. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Greg Hudno. Uh, Dr. Gregory Hudno uh, is a former high school principal and associate superintendent with the Provo City School District. He's been involved with suicide prevention for the past 25 years. Dr. Hudno is the founder of Hope for Utah, a nonprofit community based organization dedicated to suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. The school-based program, Hope Squad, has been responsible for more than 2,500 students referred for help and more than 300 hospitalized. For more than 15 years, Dr. Hudnell has led a statewide volunteer suicide crisis team that has responded to over 54 youth suicides. Dr. Hudnell has presented at numerous national and state conferences on suicide, bullying, connectedness, community collaboration, and making schools a safe place for students. Dr. Hudnell was invited to testify before the United States Surgeon General on suicide in Utah. He's presented to the U.S. Department of Health and at the national conferences of the American Psychiatric Association and the American Association of Suicidology. Dr. Hudnell was also invited to participate in a webinar on African American and suicide uh, by, the, by the White House. He has trained over 50,000 in suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. He's presented across the United States and three countries on suicide prevention, including to the Minister of Education for Madrid, Spain. Dr. Hudnell is considered one of the leading experts in community and school-based suicide prevention, intervention, and postvention. He lives by the mantra, while it takes a village to raise a child, it takes an entire community to save one. As a child psychiatrist who has seen many students, some of whom have participated in Hope Squads, I, I appreciate this uh, professionally 
and I've seen it individually and being able to help with that and, and certainly I'm looking forward to hearing his thoughts tonight. Dr. Hudnall. Great, thank you. It's an honor for me to be here and uh, I love the comments by President Jimenez and uh, her insight on resiliency. Um, I'm going to begin by uh, first, you know, the first slide really talks about what I really want to discuss and that is preventing suicide takes all of us. Uh, it really does take all of us working together. Next slide. So I want to give out a, a big shout out to Intermountain Healthcare. Uh, of course, Intermountain Healthcare, BYU and other organizations have been working together for over 12 years, but since we've been doing Hope Squads and working on suicide prevention for 20 years, Utah Valley Hospital has been our original partner. And I cannot say enough about the amazing things that they do across the state of Utah. Next. So one of the things I want to talk about is the basic principles of mental health. Um, it's really important for uh, all of us to understand that depression is a disease. It's not a self-indulgence or a failure of will and that too many times we think, oh, just get over it. I hear too, a lot of times adults, including parents and faith-based leaders and others getting frustrated with individuals that are really struggling. And sometimes even as a, as a parent or as a principal, there have been times that I thought, well, I just wish they could get over it. But I've come to realize through the years that it's very challenging and very difficult for that individual that's struggling with it. The other part of it is that it's important to remember that uh, over the last probably 50 years, we've told individuals, you know, if you're struggling, just let me know and uh, I'll come and help. Next slide. The reality in most of those cases, str individuals struggling with severe depression, a mental illness, anxiety, and other things will not ask for help. Many times they're embarrassed and they do not want anyone else to know. It's a personal struggle and they do everything they can to hide it. I use the example of an iceberg when I work with a lot of my Hope Squad students, helping them understand the challenges that many of their peers may be going through. Next. The reason people are afraid to ask for help, a lot of times it's they don't understand what they're going through. This may be their first experience and it may be starting to overwhelm them. They're unsure of available help or resources that are available in our community. A lot of times they don't know what to expect. Am I going to get locked up? Am I going to lose my job? Um, am, I, am, am I going to be put in the state hospital because everyone thinks I'm crazy? They, they deal a lot with personal shame, fear, stigma, lack of financial resources, etc. Next. We must consider ourselves on the front lines of mental health care. Whether you're a parent, whether, you, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a coach, whether you're a neighbor, whether you're a grandparent, I don't care who you are. All of us are on the front lines of mental health care. We must have the courage to reach out to those individuals who are struggling, and then rather than having them ask for help, do everything we can to get help for them. Next. So I want to go over some. My specialty, as mentioned in the introduction, is youth suicide. Uh, Hope Squads are now in about 900 schools with about 30,000 young people. Uh, and I love working with kids, having been a former high school principal and spending my career with Provo School District. Next. So here's some of the latest research that we're seeing. Uh, hospital visits for suicidal ideation and attempts by children between the ages of 5 and 17 have more than doubled between 2008 and 2015. The youngest suicide I've worked with is a fourth grader who took his life. The youngest that I have on record that has attempted is a kindergartner. So we're seeing it much younger than we ever have in the past. Next. So understanding suicide makes it a challenge because in general, with the general population, suicide is often a silent tragedy. We don't want to talk about it because we're afraid that if we talk about it, it's going to give someone the idea. When in reality, talking about it like tonight is the best thing that we can do. There's many misconceptions about suicide. A lot of times we think that suicidal people want to die and there's nothing that we can do to prevent it. But what the research continues to show us time and time again, that of all deaths, suicide is the most preventable. The number one place that people take their lives in the United States is Golden Gate Bridge. Over 3,000 people have leapt to their death. But there's been about 26 people who have actually survived. I had a chance to present with Kevin Hines in Idaho at their state conference. And we were at the airport together getting ready to fly out. And as we were sitting there talking, I leaned over and I said, Kevin, 
what was it really like for you to have that personal experience? And he said, Greg, I'll never forget. When I, when I jumped off, I, I started to do everything I could to try to re-grab the rail because I didn't want to die, but I just wanted the pain to go away. Next slide. It's interesting, as I work with parents and what we're seeing in elementary schools, age 10 is now the new age 16. We're not imagining it, childhood is getting shorter. Experts say typical teen behaviors are becoming common among kids ages eight to 12. Kids listen to pop music, you know, they text on Snapchat, drop toys for iPhones, get highlights in their hair, and think parents are annoying. Drive by a city park, I challenge you. You're not gonna see any kids out there playing pickup games, soccer, baseball, football, or whatever. What they're doing is they're at home on their electronics interacting with others. You know, too many times we as parents want our children to be popular with their peers, but it's very fuzzy about where do we draw the line? Next. So this is an interesting slide that I use a lot when I try to help educate my fellow administrators within the school system. And the challenge is for every adult that dies by suicide, there's probably 25 other adults who attempt. For every young person that dies by suicide, there's upwards of 100 other young people that attempt. It's much more common in the young people than it, what it is with adults. Next. No single cause for suicide, and it's what makes it so challenging. What's an irksome for one peer may be enough to push another off the edge. But what we do know is that suicide most often occurs when stressors exceed the current coping abilities of someone suffering from a mental health condition. They don't have the ability to, to deal or to cope with that crisis in their life. Next. I hear a lot from adults that, all they're just doing it for attention. Well, the reality is maybe, but even that is a sign for us to be aware as parents. Most teens do not spend a long time planning to kill themselves. Adults, they'll look at calendars, universe, or um, anniversaries. They'll look at different aspects, and it'll, sometimes they'll, they'll take a week, a month, even a year, planning to take their life. But young people, we call it the 24 to 48 hour window. Romantic breakup, disciplinary action, something that's happened in their life that's pushed them over the edge, and it's enough because they don't have that coping skill to push them over that edge. And so moms and dads, parents and others, all of you those that are listening tonight, if you hear a comment and someone makes a comment and you're gonna see warning signs later on, please take it seriously because you and I don't know what level they're at. You and I don't know what that trigger may be to push them to the edge. Next. Aloneness, isolation is probably the number one reason young people take their life. I hear it from a lot of young people after they've attempted. Intolerable for many individuals, and they'll do anything to avoid, uh, to avoid that isolation. Remember, by the, by the age of 14, it's more important to belong to friends than it is to family. Hard to believe, but that's the reality. That's society. Remember, Ma Maslow says families provide food, clothing, shelter, and safety. Society provides everything else. And when you go out to that peer support, whether it's in school, whether it's in community, whether it's in your, uh, your church, and you're isolated, depression goes way up. It's by far the number one thing for young people to struggle. Next. Social distancing, I wanted to throw in some slides because I get emails and phone calls from a lot of educators about this. But here's one of the things that we're seeing. Social distancing is causing social isolation, more now than ever, ever before. Next. Less time on school campus is increasing anxiety, depression, fear of being alone. I used to think that kids came to school to see me as a teacher and then a counselor and then as a principal. I learned early on they didn't come to see me. They came to see all of their friends and to be part of those extracurricular activities, band, performing arts, athletics, or whatever it is. When we take that away because of COVID, the reality is it becomes very, very difficult for them and kids really start to struggle. We struggle with it as adults. If we're struggling, Think what the kids are dealing with. Next. 
So I wanted to throw in some ideas for parents when children are being taught at home. I have grandkids. My daughter contacted me from Farmington. Uh, I have six grandkids up there, and she said, Dad, they've just canceled high school for two weeks. And my, her daughter, my granddaughter, was supposed to perform tonight in this big, uh, she plays for the orchestra. She was so devastated. But we know it's, it's hybrid. So depending on COVID and the other challenges that are happening within that school, you may have an A-B schedule. You may be home full time uh, until you're able to come back in January or whatever. But here are the things that we have find that we have found to be very helpful to help parents kind of balance those kids' time at home. Number one, plan to eat at least one meal a day as a family, and please put away the electronics whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, even a midnight snack, but do something together as a family so you're connected. Number two, schedule set times to wake up and to retire. My wife is really good about this when she works with families and works with parents. It's so important because what happens if you don't, then kids start staying up all night and, and they'll be on the television, they'll be on their phones doing whatever, and then they start to sleep during the day. They lose that cycle that is so important for them to stay healthy. And then number three, limit that time on ele electronic devices. And I know because of school, they have to be on the devices so much, but it may be, you know what, you get a, we're gonna be on the devices this long, and when school's done, you get another 45 minutes to interact with your friends, to do whatever but then we're gonna take a break from three o'clock till seven o'clock, no electronics whatsoever. We acquired time outside, and I don't care if it's 40 below zero or it's 97 degrees out, get those kids outside. It's amazing what that sun can do. It's amazing what fresh air can do to, to help them stay healthy. And then the last one, which is more difficult than ever, is encourage that daily connection with friends. Find ways for them to connect even with COVID. Next. So substance related disorders for self management. This is a challenge. Young adults and, and you heard uh, President Jimenez talk about uh, most most mental illnesses begin between the ages of 10 to 14. Think about that ages 10 to 14 young adults with undetected undiagnosed uh, untreated emerging uh, mental disorders. They're highly likely to experiment with those substances. What they find in those drugs is a temporary relief from the symptoms of depression, anxiety, or psychosis. When I would, as a high school principal, when I would pop a young person for smoking marijuana, I'd bring him into my office with my SRO, school resource officer, and I would say, why do you smoke pot? And it was amazing because that young person would say, it makes me feel normal. It helps me deal with the day. And what you saw is those kids were self-medicating. Moms and dads, if you have family members that are struggling with with uh, using um, um, drugs and other things, don't punish them. Get them to a local mental health agency or the local uh, drug and alcohol program so that they can get the help that they need to replace that self-medication with other things. Next. Victims of bullying, this is the one that challenges us the most, not only in public school, but also in the community. All you gotta do is get on I-15 and try to drive without being bullied by another driver. I mean, bullying is alive and well, unfortunately. It's in our schools, it's in our workplace, it's on television. I try to help the, the community understand that public schools are just a reflection of society. Victims of bullying, about eight to 12% of young people that take their lives are kids that have been bullied. The more severe that bullying, um, the larger the crowd, the longer it goes on. It, it, it triggers those themes of abandonment, isolation, rejection, and then devalued. Um, moms and dads, if you have a family member who's being bullied, please come in and talk with your school administrator, meet with your school counselor, and let us help you figure out ways that we can do everything we can to prevent it. Next. Acculturation issues, can I tell you, this is becoming more and more of a challenge for these young people. LGBTQ adolescents are most vulnerable to suicide and uh, suicidal ideation and attempts. They often experience a message of rejection from their primary support system. They're also the kids that are bullied the most and isolated in school. So remember what Maslow says. Maslow says families provide food, clothing, shelter, and safety, and society provides everything else. We're seeing more and more young people that are coming out, struggling, doing other things, and their families say, if you come out, we will reject you as a family. 
So they get rejected from their primary support system that is supposed to provide that food, clothing, shelter, and most important, safety. Then they go out to their peers in their community, in the school system, and they get bullied and rejected and isolated. Uh, LGBTQ kids are probably one of the top that attempt suicide uh, in that school age. Next. I get the chance, my specialty is postvention. I get to work with schools uh, all around the country that unfortunately deal with a suicide contagion or copycat. So it's when after unfortunately there's a suicide and then we lose two or three other students because of that copycat um, methodology. But this is by far one of the top reasons that uh, we find when we work with young people that are struggling um, in, a, in a school setting after a suicide. Adolescents who believe that affirmation and love are one and earned are the most vulnerable. There's no capacity to psychologically manage that failure. It's the major contribution to suicide ideation, attempts, and completion in high school settings. Moms and dads, we've created this world that unfortunately too many times you and I swoop in and do everything that we can to prevent our child from having any pain, any consequences or whatever. Because you and I remember that embarrassment, we remember the shame, we remember all of those experiences. So we don't want our child to go through it. We're seeing it more and more than ever before in schools. Parents come in, swoop, save their child, don't allow anything to happen to them. But what you and I forget is that's what built our resiliency. That's, how, that's what helped us to become what we are. It's the get knocked down, we get back up. It's exactly what President Tumena showed, you know, in those, in those pictures. The challenges that she had in life have made her what she is. When we take those away from our children because we want to save them, we forget that it takes away that resiliency. I've been in the emergency room with, with young people who have traded, tried to take their lives. And as I sit there next to their bed asking, you know, help me understand what happened, and they share that experience, I got, I got an A minus and I couldn't handle it. I got cut from the basketball team, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Moms and dads, let your child fail. Be there to help pick up the pieces, but let them fail. Next. So what are the problems that increase suicide? Prior suicide attempts, if they've never gotten help, if you have a family member who's attempted and you know about it, please get them to the professionals. Mental health disorders, history of trauma or abuse, family history of suicide, lack of social support. That connection is so critical. When I get called in to work with a family, the first thing I ask them is, give me the names of your child's best friends. And if they, sh if they can't give me enough names, that's the first place we have to start to build that support to help them get through those challenges. Next. Warning signs, what are the things we want you to listen for? Statements made by family members or coworkers or other kids. I'm going to kill myself. I wish I were dead. I wish I hadn't been born. My family's going to be better off without me. Giving away belongings. We had a young man give his watch away to a best friend. We had a, a girl take, she had a guitar she always carried. She took it off, gave it to her best friend, said, I'm not going to need this after tomorrow. Withdrawing from social contact and wanting to be left alone. Next. Saying goodbye to people as if they won't be seen again. Having the mood swings, you know, uh, being emotionally high one day and then deeply discouraged the next. Being preoccupied with death, dying, or violence. Feeling trapped, helpless, or hopeless about the situations and sometimes just about life. Next. So what are the protective factors? What are the things we can do as a family? I, I mentioned the one meal a day as a family with no electronic devices. Contact with a caring person. You know, if you, if you have a family member that's struggling, find their favorite uncle, their favorite cousin. Have them reach out and start building that support with that family member so that there's a sense of connection. Positive self-esteem, coping skills, access to and care for mental, physical, and substance disorders. Next. So interesting enough, in 2009, the American Association came out and said that violence in society is as closely associated with violence in uh, media, the social media violence, um, according to the American Association. And what they're saying is that violence in society is as closely related to media violence as between calcium intake and bone mass, lead ingestion and lower IQ, and almost as strong as the association between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. When I work with parents, parents will always tell, ask me, Dr. Hudnall, what do I do? 
one of the first things I ask them to do is find out that appropriate age for your child to have a phone. I have four kids. Each of my kids matured at a different level. You're going to have, you know your children better than anyone. It may be appropriate for your seventh grader to have a phone. You may want to wait till that child is in ninth grade, but you're going to know their ability and their impulsivity and other things. It's unfortunate, but anyone can take a cell phone, an elementary student, a middle school student, a high school student, and watch the most violent pornograph pornographic movies that just a few years ago you and I would have had to show our driver's license. And so I beg parents, please, take your child's phone away every night at 10 o'clock, put it in a charger. Don't let your child stay up all night with it under their pillow, taking care of friends, not getting the sleep that they need, and then monitor what they're doing. One time we were out for dinner and my wife reached across and grabbed my teenage son's phone. And he said, mom, what are you doing? She said, I'm checking my phone. He goes, that's my phone. And my wife smiled and said, actually, honey, this is our phone and I'm letting you use it. I encourage families to have one phone. You may have two or three kids, have one phone, let them share it. Learn how to deal with each other. Next. So uh, Marche, who is one of my favorite researchers, talks about the concept, the greater the proportions of online interaction, the lonelier you are. More, more FaceTime, less loneliness. And I know this is difficult with, with COVID, but we've got to continue those ways to interact and see face to face. It may be 12 feet across the fence where the neighbor's over there, but we've got to do more with FaceTime and less online. Next. So please remember, adolescents don't want to die. They want the pain to go away, but they don't know how to make that pain go away. Next. So what, what not to say and do? A lot of times people will ask me, what should I say? What shouldn't I say? Next. Don't, don't act shocked or lecture. Don't make them justify their suicidal feelings and don't try to fix it. Listen to what they're saying. Next. Don't say, you, you don't mean that. You don't really want to die. We say that because we're so uncomfortable. We don't know what to say. But what it does is it invalidates and it dismisses those emotions that that young person's going through. Next. Don't say things could be worse. Yeah, things could be worse, but at that moment, that child needs to have hope at the end of the tunnel. You and I may look at it and say, this is, come on, just get over it. It's just a boyfriend, a girlfriend, you know, whatever it is. But you and I cannot comprehend the emotions, and for sometimes they feel like there's nothing else to live for. So don't say things could be worse. Next. Don't say suicide is selfish. I hear this a lot. I'm seeing more and more young people who feel that they are the burden for the family. It's taking all their parents' money to pay for their medication, to pay for their therapy. Um, the, the young person that is struggling feels like they're calling, causing all the anxiety and the fights in the family. And I've heard way too many young kids say to me, you know, if I were dead, my family would be better off without me. Next. Don't say suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Yeah, it's temporary for the person who boyfriend broke up, girlfriend, uh, discipline action or whatever, but it's not temporary to that young person who is struggling with a very serious mental illness for the rest of their life. That's a, that's a lifelong challenge that they have to deal with. Next. So what do we say and do? I love this concept. When, when, they're, when they're struggling and you can tell they're struggling, be that safe person. Remain calm and listen. Listen to what they're saying. I like to use the I message. It sounds like you're going through a lot and you're hurting. What can I do to help? Next. Don't be afraid to ask the tough questions. I notice you're going through some rough times. Do you ever wish you could go to sleep and never wake up? Sometimes when people feel sad, uh, they have thoughts of harming or killing themselves. Have you ever thought that way? And then straight out, have you ever thought about killing yourself? Next. How can I help? You're not alone in this. I'm here for you. You may not believe it now, but the way you're feeling will change. I may not be able to understand exactly how you feel, but I want you to know I care about you and I'm here to help. Next. So have the courage. Have you thought about hurting yourself? Have you thought about suicide? Have you thought about killing yourself? Next. Uh, I'm gonna share this three minute video. It's put out by the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. I use it all the time with my kids. Go. I remember when my father asked me to stay. Stay up all night to watch fireflies. I didn't want to, but he was right. 
It was the most magical thing I'd seen. My mother asked me to stay. Stay patient until the chickens got here. I just wanted to pull them out of their eggs and play. I was so glad I waited. This kid I knew asked me to stay on his team. We lost the game, but he became my best friend. And when I became a teenager, everyone kept telling me to stay. Stay focused, stay out of trouble, stay faithful. And all I could think of was the stress, the pressure, the expectations. The things I used to be excited about now seem nothing like I'd imagined. Pointless, heavy. And then people asked, how are you? And I said, fine. And people said, is there anything I can do for you? And I said, no. I tried to smile and hide my darkness. I remember waking up on my 17th birthday, wanting to end my life because I felt so much pain, because I, I felt nothing. So I decided to tell others how I feel, bring everything hidden into the light, because I knew one of them could help. I remember my dad holding me, my mom and my sister. Now they ask me to stay around for another moment, for another agonizing week, month, even if I couldn't see that tomorrow will get better. And I realized that somewhere in between my new dark existence and all those beautiful moments that I've experienced in the past, I forgot something. I didn't have to stay alone. The pain doesn't fully go away. It still takes many endless conversations. Therapy, prayers, medication. But as time goes on, I choose to stay hopeful. I choose to stay. To experience small, simple things I love. To see new places, meet new people, to discover who I am, to be surprised, to be loved. You can choose to stay too. I love that message. I love the message that uh, that we all can stay too. Next slide. Um, you know, we live in a great state and we have amazing resources. And as I get the chance to travel the country, I'm so grateful to come home because we have so many organizations trying to help and, and really reach out. Um, LiveOnUtah.org is, is a, new, a new program for suicide prevention across the state of Utah. Uh, our website, HopeForUtah.com, we list every mental health agency for the state of Utah. There are 14 mental health agencies that are available, and we have amazing private practitioners that are out there. Next. This is, this is our uh, 14th year for this event, and Utah County has been very blessed to be able to have these amazing partners. Uh, Wasatch Mental Health has been helping us for over 20 years uh, make a difference. Mountain Star Hospital, United Way, NAMI of Utah, and of course, Intermount Healthcare. Next, I'm gonna end with this last slide. Uh, you can go to our website, hopesquad.com, click on our COVID resources. We have pages and pages for parents, for young people, uh, and for educators. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. And thank you, you Dr. for being with us tonight. Uh, you've given us a lot to think about as we're serving others. As you well described, aloneness and uh, isolation uh, are one of the highest risk factors for risk factors for suicide. Certainly, I see that. 
Uh, this is one of the concerns that I have with messaging around social distancing. Uh, really, my understanding is what we're talking about to support safety regarding COVID-19 is physical distancing and not isolation. I think you highlighted that so well, uh, so important. Uh, please let's remember that we are looking for physical distance to support safety around COVID-19, but that we really need to support connectedness, like Dr. Hudnell really uh, emphasized there. Appreciate the work you're doing uh, in general, of course, and tonight this, this particular presentation about how we can have this life-saving factor of connectedness. So thank you again, Dr. Hudnell. We hope you've learned a lot from these two excellent presentations. If you have questions from either uh, or for uh, either President Jimenez uh, or Dr. Hudno, please uh, remember to email them using the email addresses that are listed on our website. I want to take time to explain how to use our website and to find resources across the state. If you go to www.utahvalleyhospital.org backslash mental health night again that's www.utahvalleyhospital.org backslash mental health night you'll see several circles across the bottom of the page if you click on a circle that represents the geographic area you are interested in you'll see a list of resources i would encourage you to start with the national estate resources and then review the links that fit the area where you are located these lists focus on hospitals, not-for-profit organizations, and governmental agencies. We wanted to highlight places where people could find help with or without insurance. We know there may be resources we've missed, and we're committed to adding to the list as often as we can. Please continue to check back whenever you have the need. Help is available, and our goal is to be a place where people can find it. We know it will be difficult to remember everything you learned tonight. There's definitely one thing we want you to remember, and that's the number 211. This will connect you with United Way's Resource Center, and they can help you find resources you need in your community. Although you can call 211 at any time, there's also a link on our website that will connect you to the 211 website to explore all their options for finding resources. Thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you for your interest in learning about resources available across our state. Together, we can help others find the resources they need. Have a wonderful night. Thank you.